Amen. Welcome to the Abundant Life Living Word Church. Amen. I send greetings on behalf of our pastor and founder, Bishop A.E. Harris. On tonight, we just want to greet you in the precious name of Jesus. Um, tonight, uh, I will be standing in his stead teaching the word. Amen. And so um, we will um, open with prayer. But again, we just welcome everybody. Um, for those that are tuned in, please like this post, share this post, send this to somebody, um, use this as a witnessing mechanism so we can win the loss. Amen. So please, if you haven't, like this post, send some hearts, share it so we can win the loss. Amen. Let's go ahead and open up with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. God, we worship you, we magnify you, we, we glorify your name, oh God. We pray that you would have your uh, way here tonight. God, as we go through the word, I pray, God, use me as the teacher, God, as we begin to go through scriptures. I pray that the word uh, will be uh, uh, enlightening to those that are listening, oh God, that they would learn to the, learn from the word, that they would be able to apply it to them, their lives. God, send the anointing tonight, Lord God. We pray for those that are tuning in, Lord God, that they will be able to hear, oh God, what the Spirit say to the churches. God, and we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. So tonight, we're going to talk about what it means to serve, what it means to serve. And so um, we will begin our scripture, our focus scripture will be Matthew 20, and we'll read verses 26 through 28. So if you would get that, Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28. And um, again, the lesson tonight is what it means to serve. So Matthew 20, verses 26 to 28 reads, But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as a son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so when we talk about serving, and you think about it, um, when we talk about the ministry of service, most people don't jump at that ministry. When we think of church and we think about all the things that occur in church, most people tend to uh, gravitate toward those ministries that seem to be more out front. You know, everybody wants to preach. Everybody wants to sing and, 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 and dance or play an instrument. But not everybody wants to be a part of the ministry of service. And truthfully, to truth be told, really every part of the body, right, every ministry in the body of Christ is an act of service. Everything we do in this house should be done through the spirit of servanthood and through service, because at the end of the day, we should be serving God. And so um, tonight we're going to talk about that, what it means to serve, and we're going to get into what happens in our heart and our mind because at the end of the day it really boils down to a heart issue the reason why many of us cannot serve is not because we don't have the physical ability it's not because we don't have the talent to serve it's not because we don't know what to do it's because we don't have the heart to do it it's a heart issue jesus said that man's heart is desperately wicked and if we allow our heart to run unchecked then we'll never do the things that God has called us to do. We'll never do the things that the Spirit is um, leading us to do. We'll always fall victim to our heart. That's the reason why we can't walk in faith and emotions at the same time. Faith and emotionalism don't, don't work hand in hand. If you are led by your emotions, you'll never be able to accomplish the things that God has for you. Why is that? What God does is the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. And so what happens, everything that goes on to us in life, there's always, it's always a, a, a step of faith. There's always um, something that you have to overcome that's going to require faith, right? Um, you may have noticed this since you've been saved. Everything in life doesn't always come easily, right? It doesn't just fall in your lap. But there's always an element of faith to everything we do. Why is that? Well, the Bible says that it's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so we have to have faith in order to please him. But here's the thing. Here's the catch, right? Going back to that heart issue. 
if we're always inclined to act and be um, driven by our emotions and our heart, right, then we won't walk in faith. And what will happen is we'll react to what we see and we'll let emotions and right uh, drive us in the wrong direction when in reality we shouldn't be walking by sight. We should be walking by faith anyway. That same dynamic exists when we talk about service because when we should be walking and doing and operating in service, what we're doing is we allow our heart to drive us. We allow our flesh and really our emotions to drive us, and they're never going to lead you to serve. If you're expecting your emotions to lead you to serve, they're going to serve. They, they may serve something, but you're just going to serve yourself. And that's what happens in the world today, in our common culture, in our um you know, in the world today, everything is about self. Think about it. Think about some of the catchphrases we hear today. Self, self-care, self right? I'm a self-made millionaire. I mean, all this stuff is all about self. Self, 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 self. People, they got the one uh, catchphrase, treat yourself, right? Everything is all about self. But you don't really, it's not popular to be a servant, you know, um, it's not something popular. That's not a popular um, uh, mode of operation. But that's the way that God has called us to walk and operate. And so when we read here in Matthew, it says, Matthew 20, verse uh, 26, but it shall not but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And so the way things work in our world is those that are great, they want people to serve them. Right. They want servants. They want people to do their bidding. And he ta- uses the word minister. Basically, to be a minister means to serve. Now, in today's culture, right, people view ministry totally different. They don't view ministry as to serve and service, but they view it. You have some that view it that someone should come and serve them. You have some that view it that this is me in the spotlight. I'm, I'm ministering. It's not what it's about. It's about service, right? Whether or not people see you do what you're doing should not matter. The only thing that matters is that you're serving God and you're doing it to the glory of God and you're doing it with the spirit of excellence and doing it unto him, not unto people. That's part of the problem with servanthood is many of us can't serve because we're too busy worried about what, uh, who, who's going to see what I'm doing. If that's your motivation to serve, then you'll never serve with the right motive. Regardless of what you accomplish, right? You can actually accomplish something that's great, but if you do it with the wrong motives, then you you really kind of wasted your time because you didn't do it unto God, you do it unto men. And Jesus said you have your reward, right? We go into um, Matthew where Jesus were referring to the Pharisees, how they would pray and they would want to be out in front and want everybody to see them praying, you know, the religious leaders of that time. They want everybody to see them praying, you know, they're, they're so spiritual, God wasn't pleased with that, but they had their reward. What was their reward? The fact that everybody saw them praying. That was a small reward, right? That's that's what you call a cheap reward. So you don't want your service to come off as a cheap reward, but you want your service to honor God. And how you honor God is you do it not about who sees, but you're doing it unto him. It kind of goes hand in hand with integrity. You know, when somebody has integrity, you do the right thing regardless of who's looking. Right. And so with service, you're willing to serve regardless of who's who's looking around. Um, A person with a heart to serve serves at the same level, regardless of if they're serving by themselves or someone's watching. Give you a perfect example. If I have a heart to serve, let's say my task is cleaning the church. That means I clean the church the same way if someone is watching me cleaning, then if I'm here by myself, what does that mean? I'm not here cutting corners. I'm not just vacuuming one side and don't vacuum the side that I didn't see anybody walk on, but I'm going to vacuum the whole church. Why? Because I want to, I want to, I'm here to serve. I'm here to give God my all. I'm here to put my all into what I'm doing. Right. Um, what is that called? We call it a spirit of excellence, right? Um, you hear us talk about that a lot in church. Um, I believe that in order to tr- truly have a heart of a servant, you've got to operate in excellence because having that spirit of excellence will drive everything you do. It will drive you to keep um, doing those things you don't feel like doing. It will drive you to not only do a task, but to do it in a way that pleases God, right? It will drive you to do a task regardless if you're going to get recognition or credit. 
You know, servanthood has nothing to do with recognition. You don't you don't serve for recognition, not at least earthly recognition. You know, um, I serve because I know one day I'm going to have to appear before God and I want God to say unto me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know, I don't want to get up there and him say, I never knew you depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You know, I don't want to spend all my time in church Sunday in, Wednesday out, Sunday in, Wednesday out and get get up there. And God's like, oh, I never knew you. You spent all that time, but all that was for the wrong motive. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about what it means to serve, because we won't want to be serving God in vain. I don't want to serve him in vain. Right. I want to serve God with the right heart and the right motive. And so uh, Matthew verse 26 but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. So he, Jesus is equating being great or being, uh, um, uh, um, well, being great with servanthood, being a minister. Verse 27, and whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Again, this is a contrast to our society, right? We don't look at servants as someone great, right? But that's what Jesus said. He said, whoever will be chief among you will be your Servant, verse twenty-eight. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life as a ransom for many. We look at Jesus. Jesus came into this world to be a. He came to be a, a, a servant for us, right? He came to be a ransom for many. In other words, He was our sacrifice for sin, and we'll get into that um, later. Um, but again, when we talk about serving, um, you know. Real servanthood, again, it goes back to the heart. It goes back to um, how we truly, what what are you really trying to do? What is your purpose for serving? And then if that purpose is to please God, then you won't have a problem with serving. But if, you're, if, if you don't have a desire to serve God, then you're going to run into problems. It's kind of like, um, you know, we come to church, those that go to church, and let's just say pre covid pre-pandemic when we were intent attending in-person church services um we would come to church right and we would come and we would sit and we call it a worship service but really when you think about it when you come and you just come if you just simply come and sit you didn't come and serve right you just came and sat somebody told you to stand up clap your hands you stood up clap your hands they told you to sit down you sat down they told you to give you get you didn't really serve you just came but service is that every everything that happens in the ministry there's there's a piece there's a portion there's a department there's an auxiliary there's a ministry you find somewhere where you fit and you try to help and you become a part of the body right that service right it's more than just attending certain church is more than just participating in the worship but you come and you serve god through action right through your work through whatever you contribute to the body and if you're one of those people that you you haven't found your niche listen find something to put your hands to do so that you can use whatever god has given you god has given you something you can't sit there and say well god didn't give me anything god gave you something you have some gifts some talent there is something you have to contribute to the kingdom of god and God is expecting us to bear some fruit, whatever he gave you. We always reference uh, Matthew chapter 25, uh, the parable of the pounds. He gave one five talents. He gave one two talents, and he gave one one. The lesson to be learned there is um, he gives every man, you know, according to his um, a, a measure of faith, or he gives every man kind of, it's different depending on what God has given you. But the point is you do some of what he gave you. So the one he gave five, he produced five more. The one that he gave two talents, he produced two more talents. But the one that he gave one didn't do anything with it. So it doesn't matter if he gave you five or one, do it whatever God has given you and be fruitful what he's given you. And then in turn, you'll be serving God, right? But don't just sit there and say, well, nobody came and asked me to do anything. That's an excuse, right? You don't have a heart of a servant. And you're waiting for somebody to come and tap you on your shoulder and say, hey, the Lord told me that you need to be the person to greet people at the door. Like, no, don't wait on somebody. You get up and you find something to put your hands to do, right? That's the heart of a servant. A heart of a servant has initiative. There's somebody that looks for something to do. They, they're always looking. You can see the gap. You get in. You move. You make it happen. And so... 
servanthood. That's that's what we're talking about. Jesus was our perfect example. Um, we read in Matthew where it says um, he came to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came um, to give. He was our sacrifice for sin. Right. Um, man sinned in the Garden of Eden or Adam sinned. And so every man that came from Adam was born into sin and iniquity. And so we had a sin nature. We had an Adamic nature. It was going to take Christ to deliver us from that Adamic nature and give us um, the uh, opportunity to have eternal life. Right. And so when Jesus came down, in the form of man, he came as a servant. And we're going to read in um, Philippians exactly what he did. So Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 through 9. Give you a minute to turn there. Philippians 2, 2 through 9. I think this is important because when we talk about Jesus and we talk about him taking the form of a servant, he was, uh, and we'll get into what he did. You know, how can I say that I can't serve when Jesus, who was God, who was God in the flesh, if he could serve, who am I to say that I can't serve in any capacity in the church, regardless of what it is? I don't care who. I don't care what they ask me to do. You ask me to. I, I want you to clean. I want you to dust the flowers. Now, quite frankly, dusting flowers doesn't quite come across as a masculine task. Nevertheless, I'll do it. Why? Because I want to serve. I want to do whatever is necessary. In the, in the kingdom, right? So Philippians 2, 2 through 9, um, it says, Fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through vain, through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now just to kind of pause right there, one of the things that will get in the way of you serving is it talks about doing things through strife and vainglory. When you're trying to get the shine, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not um, operating in the spirit of a servant, right? You're trying to get shine. You're trying to get some glory. You want people to see what you can do. Um, you have to look at it like this. It's not about displaying and demonstrating what I can do, but it's about glorifying God, right? Somebody may see it. They may not. They may recognize you contributed. They may not, but that's irrelevant. The point is that God knows and he sees everything. So when we do things through strife and vain glory, that gets in the way of us being a true servant. It says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Again, we can't be caught up in self. We can't be too busy looking at self that we can't serve one another. Um, and that's a part of, of, of serving, too, that I think we um, struggle with is that we don't esteem other better than ourselves. And so we talked about service in the context of church, but it goes beyond that. Right. Sometimes service is uh, me doing something for my brother or my sister or me um, being there for someone in need or me ministering. Remember, minister means to serve ministering to a soul in need when I don't esteem them better than myself then I, I don't I come up with all these excuses I don't have time to do it I don't have the resources to do it I don't have the money to do it you know this gets into why many of us don't witness because we don't esteem the needs of others better than ourselves we're too busy worried about our problems our bills what's going on with what what you know whatever's going on in our headspace that we don't take the time to esteem the needs of the person next to us that who may or may not be saved, who may or may not know the plan of salvation, but we too busy worried about ourselves. But here in Philippians it says, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. When we get to this point, this is a necessary step in the love that it takes for us that's going to require or that's going to help us to have the burden for souls for us to reach out to people. Let's, I mean, let's just pause right there for a minute, right? Because we talk about witnessing all the time. We talk about that we're not sharing the gospel. And it's not that we're not, we're not um, coming in contact with these people. We come in contact with a lot of people a lot of times, right? Even in this pandemic, right? You haven't just been at home. You've been to the grocery store. You've been to the gas station, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of times what happens is we get so caught up in what we have to do that we don't take the time to even have the, the burden to spark a conversation to possibly have a door to open to uh, 
share the gospel with somebody. Well, we got to esteem others better than ourselves. We can't be so caught up in self that we don't even care, that we don't even. And what happens is that we get so caught up in ourselves, we don't even notice something right in front of us. We're so caught up in sales. It could be a person sitting right next to us going through and we don't even know it. This is how we have people in the church. We see every day they sit right next to us and we didn't realize that this person was depressed. Why? Because we didn't esteem their needs better than ours. We were so caught up in self. We didn't even notice that our brother was depressed the whole time. We didn't even notice it. Why? We were too caught up in sales. We didn't care. Right. What am I getting at? The spirit of a servant. In order to get to the reason why we're not able to actually do it, we got to get to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is we too caught up itself that we didn't even notice that this person was dealing with. And I just use depression as an example, but it could be anything, right? Um, I use children, for example. Children a lot of times don't come out and tell you that they're dealing with issues, right? Depending on what it is, they may not feel comfortable. But sometimes if you pay attention to a child, you can notice the signs, you can notice a pattern in behavior. And what we do sometimes is we get too caught up in self that we're not even paying attention to what's happening. But take that a step deeper. As parents, we cannot get too caught up in our lives that we're not paying attention to our children. That is service. That is an extension. That is a part of service. A pa a parenting is servant service, right? It And what is service? Service is work. It's full-time work. It don't quit. And so when you have your kids, and regardless of what's going on in your life, guess what? They got stuff going on in their life, too. And we can't be so caught up in sales that we're not even paying attention to what's going on with them. And so a lot of times we miss the signs. Why? They go to your room, you go to your room. Everybody caught up in themselves. But as the parent, we, you were supposed to make be the one observing and looking and trying to see, okay, what's going on with this one? Let me see how I can reach out to them. It goes back to service. It's the heart of a servant, right? When we talk about neglect, again, it's a heart issue because we're not, we're so caught up in what we got going on that we don't even pay attention to those right around us. And so again, going back to the scripture where it says, uh, esteeming other better than themselves, really to have a heart of the servant, you know, you, you, you really think of others more than you, you know, your life doesn't consume all your thoughts because there's more to life than you. If we had some People here in the sanctuary, I would have somebody turn and look at somebody and say, your life is more than just you, right? That's the heart of the matter when we talk about servanthood. It's more than just what I got going on. So verse um, four, it says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I think that just kind of, I, I just hit that, right? Look not every man on his own thing. In other words, don't just get so caught up in you. And we, we just said that. Um, but verse 5, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, so now we're going somewhere. So now Paul is saying the mindset that you need to have was the mindset that Christ Jesus had. In other words, the other mindset that I mentioned, when you're caught up in your own things, that's not the mindset of Christ. When Christ walked the earth, he wasn't solely caught up in himself. But when you read the Gospels and you look at Jesus and you look at uh, where he went um, geographically and historically, his ministry was about other people, right? His conversation was about other people, was about what God had called him to do. He told them he was about his father's business. And so um, that's the mind we got to have. Verse 6 says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God? We know Jesus was God, right? Jesus was not the second person in the Godhead. He was not the uh, second person of the Trinity. Jesus was fully God, fully man, all at the same time. Um, when he says he was in the form of God, the Bible says he was the image of the invisible God, right? So Jesus was God in the flesh. God manifest in the flesh. Um, and he came to do a work, right? I think I mentioned earlier Many of us struggle with servanthood, but you look at God. God was able to come down in the form of a man and serve and do the work of salvation for us. What makes us think we can't, as humans, do simple tasks? That's ridiculous. 
So verse 6, it says, Who being in a form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, Jesus was God, right? He was fully God. He was fully man all at the same time. Verse 7, But made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. Remember, when Jesus walked to earth, remember, he was a carpenter. He was an ordinary looking man. It says he took, made himself of no reputation. So he wasn't, he didn't come in grandness and, and wasn't walking around pompous. And that's the reason why the Jews didn't really receive him because they were waiting on their king. They were waiting on, in their mind, the Messiah was going to be one that was going to restore the kingdom. And they were waiting on someone to look kingly and royal. But when he came ordinary, they didn't recognize him. That's how they missed it, right? Um, but he made himself with no reputation, took upon a form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Again, like I said, God took on the form of a man to be a to to, to be the to be a servant. Verse eight, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so he had to humble himself um, and become obedient unto death. Why? Well, because he had no sin. We know the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Jesus had no sin. So when he was crucified, he would have just sat there on the cross all night and wouldn't have died. But he humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, right? So that he could be the sacrifice for sins. What am I saying? We're talking about the mind that Jesus had, right? We're talking about the form of a servant. And what God did was, and again, we're talking about the omnipotent God, the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God. Th that God came down into the earth in the form of flesh and died one of the most vile deaths. If you research crucifixion, it's one of the most vile deaths that anybody could have died of so much so that if you do a little research in the roman society they didn't even mention the word cross because it was so vile he died that death for us he did that for us because he saw you and you and you two thousand some years down the line he knew he had to do that what kind of mentality am i talking about i'm talking about the mentality of a person that's willing to do what it takes in through the motivation of love. It all goes back to love. Bishop been teaching the past couple of weeks about love. The love has got to be your motivation. It was love that drove Jesus to the cross. It was love that drove him to do, uh, to die for our sins, to give up the ghost. It was love that drove him to do all of that. That's got to be the mentality we have. But we can't get to that if we caught up in self. We can't be so uh, consumed with our life and our goals and our careers and our ambitions or whatever the case may be that we don't allow any love in to do anything for anybody else. And that's not the mind of Christ, but actually the mind of Christ was he humbled himself. Humility is a big part of it. Many of us not willing to humble ourselves. We, 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 some of us, we think we're too good to do certain things. That's ridiculous. Jesus humbled himself. If Jesus, again, I'm going to say this again, if Jesus, the Lord, God, could come down from heaven and come in the form of a man and die one of the most vile deaths, who are we to say a certain task is beneath us or we can't do? That's ridiculous. We, if we have the heart of a servant, we're willing to do whatever it takes in this kingdom to make the ministry go forward. Whatever you can add, I'm willing to do. I'm willing to fill in the gap. I'm willing to step in and do it. Why? Because I got the heart of a servant. I want to serve God. I'm not here to serve people, but I'm here to serve God. That drives you when you go through issues in the church. That drives you when you go through relationship issues. Because it's going to happen. Job says, man born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. Trouble is going to happen. If you think you're going to go through life and not go through anything, you are incredibly naive. Just because we're saved doesn't mean we don't go through life. Life is coming, right? It's here. There are things you go through. There are obstacles. But when you have the heart of a servant, you don't let that slow down your service. When we talk about service, we're talking about a continuation, we're not talking about I served on Sunday and then I take a break Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. No, it's a continuation. It's consistent. Service implies consistency. And consistency, consistency only happens when you have the right mind. But that mind does not allow your life situations to get in the way. Life happens to everybody, right? Um, 
everybody has issues. We all got stuff going on. You know, I hear people say, "Well, I, I got a, I got a limited, uh, I got a limited income." We all got limited incomes, right? We all have issues we got going on, but we can't keep that from us serving. We might go through some of our life, and it's it's it's, it's devastating. We got to keep serving. We can't let that be an excuse, you know, because what the tendency of our flesh is, something will happen in our life and we'll stop serving. Our flesh wants to do nothing. Let's just be honest. The flesh wants to do nothing. The flesh doesn't want to be bothered. The flesh, it says, don't call me, don't text me, don't ask me to do nothing, leave me alone. That's what the flesh says. And if you think I'm lying, you know I'm telling the truth, Right? The flesh says, this is an off day. I ain't expecting no text, no church people. Don't text me. Don't call me. Ain't nobody here, so I can't look at facial expressions. But service is consistent. It don't matter what day. It could be a Tuesday. I'm willing to serve, right? I could be dealing with something else, but my mindset is still, listen, I'm still in gear to serve God, right? Yeah, I got something going on. Yeah, I got some stuff going on in my life. Yeah, there's some issues going on, you know, some things I'm worried about. I'm going to put that on the shelf, and I'm going to keep serving. Because guess what? When I get done serving, it's still going to be right there waiting for me. Me sitting here worrying about it and complaining about it and overanalyzing it is not going to make it go anywhere. And that's what another thing we got to be careful about in the flesh is the flesh has the tendency to have an issue. And we we do it like CNN and ESPN. You know, it's like a play by play. We overanalyze and overanalyze it. Right. Back in the day when we watched sports, we didn't have all that play by play. If you didn't catch it when it happened, that was it. Nowadays, you can watch a game, and not only could they do the replay, you can do your own replay. You could pause it, rewind it, and see exactly if they were in the end zone or not. That's what we do with our life and issues. Somebody says something out the way to us, it messes our head up. We overanalyze it all night. Then we call one person, we talk about it. Then we call somebody else and talk about it. All the while, we're getting our focus off what it needs to be. Now, I'm not here to suggest that when things happen in life, you don't have a reaction to it. Okay, that's for me. To, that's not exact. That's not what I'm assuming at all, or uh, meant, uh, trying to uh, suggest at all. What I am saying is, don't allow yourself to get. Uh, what we call paralysis by analysis. Don't overanalyze it. Okay, it's an issue. Can you do anything about it? No. Put it on the shelf. Let's get to work. Because there's work to do and you know what you need to do. Everybody here knows what you either need to do or could be doing. I'm going to take a pause right there. If I had a glass of water, I would drink it. Everybody knows what you should be doing, everybody knows what you could be doing. What's in the way? Don't let life get in the way because it's never going to stop. If you're expecting your life to slow down so that you can have clear space to just operate and serve in the church, you're going to be waiting because life is just not going to do it. It's always going to be something. That's just how life is. And so Christ... Jesus, when he came, says, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Just like Jesus became obedient unto death and submitted himself to death, which was, um, again, it was, um, the Bible says, the wages of sin is death. That only happened to, you know, humans, right? We got to become obedient to whatever it is that we need to serve, right? Whatever. Um, thing we need to do, we need, in our mind, we need to submit ourselves and do whatever that thing is and don't allow life to get in the way. Then verse 9, it says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. We all know this, that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God. Right? But before he got exalted, notice what he did. He humbled himself. Right. Most of us, we want to be exalted. But we don't want to humble ourselves. We don't want to put the work in. We just want to be exalted for doing nothing. Right. That spirit of entitlement. Exalt me because I'm worthy. No. Humble yourself and work. Do some service. Amen. So Jesus was our perfect example. If he could humble himself, surely we can. He didn't let things get in the way. Right. Um, when he was doing his ministry, uh, the Pharisees always had stuff to say. They were always trying to jam him up. He kept doing he kept doing ministry. He kept teaching. He was doing he was about his father's business. And that's what we got to do as Christians. The heart to serve. 
hard to serve. And so, um, again, when Jesus uh, came, he humbled himself, humbled himself to a very vile death. Amen. Regardless of whatever it is that we know we need to do, you just face it. You know, don't allow um, whatever you think that you are serving or whatever work you're trying to put in or whatever the task is, don't let it overwhelm you. Right. But if you put your heart in it and God to get in that thing. Right. Um, there are certain things that God has put in your heart to do. Do you feel like you really can't do it? You're right. You can. But through God, you can. <laughs> right. All God's asking you to do is put forth some effort. Right. We can do all things through Christ that strengthened us. Some of us, we started on the path of doing certain things and we made up. We made a mistake. And what we do, we stop, we quit, we throw in a towel because we made one mistake. It didn't go exactly the way we wanted to do. That's not the heart of a servant. You keep serving. Yes, you may make some mistakes. Yes, in your path to service, you may do something wrong or you may, it may not come across, you know, as grand as you thought it was going to be. That's just a part of it. It's just like anything else in life. The first time we do something, it doesn't always come off spectacular, right? You can ask any preacher. The first sermon was probably not one that everybody was standing and shouting about, but they didn't stop, right? Um, anybody that plays sports, the first time you either hit a baseball or uh, try to shoot a uh, the basketball, probably didn't either knock it out the park or you know hit it hit and hit the ball in all net. But you keep trying, you keep doing it. Don't let that be an excuse for you not serving. Again, excuses we can't allow those things to get in the way. And later we're going to talk about symptoms of not having the heart to serve. One of those is excuses. Um, the other thing is uh, Jesus demonstrated servant leadership. And so one of the things that he did uh, in being a servant is when we read in John 13, he demonstrates this when he washes the disciples' feet. Again, no task was too low for him, Right. He wasn't intimidated by washing their feet. He had a problem doing that. Now, con consider this. We can't really fathom how nasty of a job that was because most of us wear shoes. Well, let's put this in, let's, let's put this in context for a moment. Um, think about not only feet, right? And this may come off comical, but I'm not really meaning to be humorous. But think of feet, but grown men, their feet, who have been wearing sandals. And that's the only thing they own. They walk everywhere they go. They don't have paved roads. They don't have clean sidewalks, right? They're walking in dirt and dust and grass and probably have blisters and calluses on their feet. Jesus washed their feet. He wasn't too good to wash their feet, right? He displayed servant leadership. So John 13 um, is where we're going, we're going to read there. And this is significant because I think a lot of this really gets into some of the things that gets in the way of us serving. Uh, verse 4, John 13, 4. Um, and another thing I just want to mention too is uh, when Jesus washed their feet, this was right before his betrayal. And um, he knew he had limited time. And so he wanted to teach them a very important and significant act of leadership. And this was one of them. Uh, John 13, 4, and he rises from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. Part of servanthood is this. Before he went into the task, he had to prepare himself. Right. He didn't just jump right into it. He laid aside his garments. Right. Part of service sometimes is your preparation. Many of us, we struggle with service because we just quite frankly aren't prepared. We're not putting the right heart into it. We just haphazardly do stuff. Um, but the first step is he prepared. He girded himself. He didn't just come and just start washing feet. But he took off his garments and he girded himself, right? Another thing to note, he took off some stuff. Sometimes in order for us to serve, we got to cast some stuff off of us, right? Preconceived notions, all that stuff. Cast that off so you can get down and get to work. It says, after that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And then cometh he to Simon Peter. And Simon said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Right? Because Peter's like, wait a minute. We should be washing your feet. You're, you're the leader. Why are you washing my feet? Verse 7, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, 
but thou shalt know hereafter. So after he had washed their feet, he taken up his garments and was set down again. He said unto them, know you not what I have done unto you. He was showing them an example of leadership. He was showing them um, that really uh, personifying that scripture that we read earlier, that um, whosoever is great among you, let him be your minister, right? So greatness is really in servanthood, right? Though the one that's great, is the one that's willing to serve, the one that's willing to do for others, the one that esteems the needs of others greater than themselves. That's really what we should be trying to get to as a church is looking at the needs of others. How is that uh, manifested in our life? If we esteem the needs of others greater than ourselves, how is that manifested in life? And I understand nobody's here to say anything, but in your home, think about it. Prayer. If we truly esteem the needs of others more than ourselves, we know our brothers and sisters. We got the Holy Ghost. A lot of times the Holy Ghost deals with us. He puts people in our heart, puts people in our mind. You may you may not have the money to bless somebody. You may, you know, they may be out of town. You may not be able to get to them. But one thing you can do is pray. One thing you can do is intercede for people. But it's amazing how, as simple as that is, how often we don't. And we say we don't have time to pray, but we got time to do everything else. Uh, for those of you that have iPhones, I have an iPhone. Uh, if you've updated it, there is this mechanism where it records your screen time. And it keeps a log of like how much time you spend on your phone. And sometimes I'm shocked and quite frankly kind of embarrassed by the amount of screen time on my phone, Right. And some of you probably have experienced the same thing, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. But let's take that a step deeper. If you have an iPhone, and if you've seen the screen time, your screen time, right? Or the next time you see it, think about it. And think about this. Hmm, have I spent more time on my phone than I have praying? Have I spent more time Reading emails, checking text messages, scrolling Facebook, Instagram, more than I've spent time asking God to touch this person, bless this person, heal this person, and going in for our brothers and our sisters. It's just a thought, right? Um, and again, it, it, the word cuts coming and going, right? I've seen it and I've been embarrassed, quite frankly. Um, I can do better, but I, but, but yet and still I bring that up because... That is, I think, what Jesus was wanting to teach the disciples is that we've got to learn how to esteem the needs of others greater than ourselves. It's more than just you. It's not just about you, but you got to be willing to get down on your knees. You got to be willing to sometimes in the middle of the night when you wake up in the middle of the night and you go in the kitchen and get you a cold glass of water and you can't go back to sleep. Don't just sit up and just watch TV because you can't go back to sleep. But pray. Sometimes when God wakes up in the middle of the night, he wants you to pray for somebody. And some of us have woken up in the middle of the night and the person went across our minds and we still didn't pray. We got that bot, we got that cold glass of water, we used the bathroom, and went right back to bed. Listen, it's again the heart of a servant. It's a heart. You put the needs of others greater than yourself. Um, and so then verse 13, we're gonna go down, John 13, verse 13. He says, Ye call me master and lord, and, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If then, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he sent greater than he that sent him. And so that servanthood is what he really wanted them to understand. That goes into everything we do, right? Um, it's not about titles. It's not about who this, you know, it's all about serving God and doing what God, doing what we can do within our capacity to please God and help one another. Again, it all goes back to love. One of the things Jesus said is this. He said, you can sum up all the law and the prophets with two things. Love the Lord your God with all thy heart, soul, and strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. If I love my neighbor as myself, my actions would be different. I wouldn't behave the way I do if I loved you the way I love me. Think about that. If I truly loved you the way I love myself, I would treat you differently. I wouldn't talk about you behind your back. I wouldn't snicker and laugh when things happen to you. 
right? I'm just being real. We know we do this. I wouldn't, um, you know, not help when I could, right? Love people as you love yourself. Again, all that is the base of servanthood. Until we get there, we will never be able to have a heart of a servant. Uh, I think Bishop quoted this scripture last week. How can we say we love God who we've never seen when we can't love our brother who we see every day? How can you have, how can you claim to love God? How could you claim, how could you possibly claim to be a Christian? I thought about this as well. I thought about, you know, when we talk about police and we always used to say, you know, police that were here to protect and to serve. Protect, okay, I see that. But to serve, in order to serve the community, you have to value those people in the community at least to some degree. You may love them or you may not, but you at least value them. You're going to protect and serve them. You can't value me. I can't be, uh, you obviously don't value me if I'm being killed by you for unreasonable reasons, right? It's a heart issue. That's really what we're dealing with, right? So the heart, the, to, be, to, to truly serve, it gets down into the heart. You really got to be willing to love a person. You got to be willing to give up whatever stereotypes you have. You know, some people struggle with service because they got some bitterness of forgiveness because of something somebody else did for them. And now you can't do nothing for nobody else. Everybody else has to be suffer because of what somebody did to you years ago. You got to get over that. You got to forgive and let go. Holding on to what people did to you. How has that helped you? How's that going for you? How's holding on to bitterness and, and, and grudges and i never forget. How's that helping you? That's not helping you. You're only punishing yourself. Let that go so that you can be free be, and be liberated to where you can love the way you need to. You can't truly love the way you need to when you're holding on to grudges and, and things that somebody did to you and you just can't forgive them. And I know it's hard depending on what they did, but you got to let it go. You have to release that person, right? Here's the thing. Whatever they did to you, they made a mistake, whether knowingly, whether it was intentional or unintentional. The reality is we've done something to somebody ourselves, whether intentional or unintentional. And we pray that somebody forgive us. We pray that somebody will have mercy on us. We should do the same for the other person. We should allow that other person to get over whatever they did. Because whenever, until we do, we'll never be able to love the way God intends us to love, which then will affect how we serve. Because we can't truly serve until we can truly love the way we need to love. Amen. That was the thing that I think Jesus really uh, personified is just love. You know, the Bible says he came into his own and his own received him not. Imagine how that felt. He came to his own people. He was... A Hebrew, they did not receive him, right? Um, Jesus said, "A prophet is not without honor, except among his own country, among his own kindred." Imagine how that felt. But he didn't let that stop him from doing the work of the ministry. He kept going. He kept dying. The Bible says that God so loved the world, the world that He gave His only begotten Son, right? So that we have everlasting life. He died for the the, the world, right? Uh, there were some Jews that got saved after him dying. So he didn't just uh, allow those that didn't receive him to prevent the rest of the Jews from being saved. There were some Jews that got saved. You understand what I'm saying? And so I say that to say, for those of us that are holding on to things and, and issues and unforgiveness, let it go, right? Let it go. It's getting in the way. It's preventing, it's preventing you from being effective in the kingdom because you're not willing to give it your all. You're not willing to be vulnerable. You're not willing to love in the way that you need to in order to truly serve. And so um, other Hindus, other things come in the way of service, right? Um, and for some of us, it's like, well, it's pride. Pride gets in the way because we feel like, why do I have to do this? Why I got to do this? Why they ask me to do this? If your response is, why did they ask me to do it? You got a problem with service. If that's your response, why they ask me? Why didn't they ask you? Why not you? How come you can't help with whatever they ask you to do, right? Heart of a servant. The other thing is um, not really knowing what to do. <laughs> so sometimes people can serve because they're like, well, I don't know what to do. 
simply put, you just do whatever needs to be done, right? Um, I think about, I use it as a perfect example. Um, you know, for those of you who haven't been here, Deacon Reynolds has done some amazing work. And um, I'm not going to divulge all the details or let it be sort of a surprise. But I will say some of the things that he has done when I was here, the few times that I helped him, I didn't know what to do, right? But I wanted to serve, wanted to help, wanted to do something. Even if it's just me standing there holding the hammer. You need this? Okay, there you go. <laughs> I'm serving, right? I may not know exactly what to do, but I know, okay, he needs that hammer. I'll grab the hammer and hold it for him, right? You just step in. You do whatever needs to be done. And I believe that God meets you halfway. I believe God gets in it when if you would at least give an effort and try. Amen? Amen. So you can't allow, like, little stuff like that to get you, um, prevent you from serving. Um, that's something that we're not doing enough in the churches. We're not serving the way we should. And I, I say that because we don't see the outcomes that we should see. We talk about fruit a lot. We talk about souls. We talk about people being one in the kingdom. If we truly had the heart to serve, we would see more souls being saved. But the reason why we don't is because we don't have that heart and we're not putting the needs of others before us. And so then, therefore, we don't reach out. We don't spend the time. You know, when we talk about service, it's going to require some inconvenience. You know, it may require you to spend an extra 30 minutes in the grocery store talking to this lady about her problems. Why? Because you, you, you're, you're displaying love for this person because you want to win this soul, right? But you're willing to do it because you had a heart of serving. But many times we don't do it. Why? Because we're in a rush. We got to get going. So I've had these symptoms down here. One symptom that you don't have a heart to serve is busyness. Some of us, we're just too busy. We're too busy to serve. We're busy, 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 busy doing nothing. We're not getting nothing accomplished. We're just busy, but we ain't got no time to serve. Now, you got two problems there. One, you know, you just run in doing nothing. You're basically unproductive, right? Because you're, if you're not getting anything accomplished, you're just busy. You're just unproductive. But two, uh, your priorities are in the wrong place. If, you're, if your time is solely consumed with stuff that have no outcomes, uh, as it relates to anything spiritual, that's a problem. You didn't put, you haven't put God first. And so part of being, having a heart of a, of a servant is that you put God first, right? Regardless of what's going on, look, God is first. So I'm going to be there. They asked me to come and do whatever the task for the church. I'm there. Why? I put God first. That's my priority. I'm not going to give 110% at work and give 50% at church, Right? I'm not too busy at work that I can't put all my effort into whatever I got to do with church. Why? Because I got to have the heart of a servant. And so, again, you got to be careful with busyness because if you're just busy and unproductive, that'll get in the way. Um, but I'll tell you, we talked about love and we talked about esteeming the needs of others more than ourselves. Part of, I think, um, one way that a heart of a servant is manifested is how you communicate because a lot of us struggle with communication with either our friends, church members, wife, husband, children. And a lot of it is because, because we're so consumed with ourself and our heart and in our mind, when we're communicating, we're really not even listening to what they're saying, but we're really just thinking of a response to either whatever was said or we're just waiting for them to finish talking so we can go do something else. That's where you get real quiet. Many of us struggle with communication because we don't have the heart of a servant. It is a manifestation of servanthood, in my opinion, to be a good listener. Because you take the time to listen to what the other person has to say. And you may have a response, but you... Uh, have enough control of your flesh where you keep it to yourself and let them finish. I know somebody's back there just like, yeah, <laughs> let them finish, right? Why? Because I'm esteeming the needs of this person more than myself. The need for them to, for the need that they have for, my, for me listening is more important than me getting my point across, right? It, and so what happens is neither when either person is listening, both persons, both people are trying to tell their point and you come up with nothing. Right. But that gets down to, I think, in my opinion, it's, it's a manifestation of servanthood or the lack thereof. But if you have a heart of a servant, you'll listen and you'll listen long. Right. I had a I was talking with 
um, you know, brother the other day, we were just saying, you know, you got to be patient. You got to listen. You know, um, the way, uh, you know, women communicate is different than the way men communicate. You know, usually men, we can get it out pretty simple, pretty straightforward, you know, a couple sentences. You know, with women, usually, I love y'all, but y'all, it's going to be a detailed passage. But that's okay. If I got the heart of a servant, I'm going to sit there, I'm going to listen, right? I'm going I'm to subdue my flesh, and I'm going to listen to the whole story, right? Because I'm esteeming the need of the person I'm listening to more than myself, what am I talking about? A heart issue, right? Heart issue. And so I think when we don't have the heart of a servant, it's manifest in different ways. We're not communicating properly. We're not even listening. We're not paying. We're not even paying attention to what the person is saying to us. And so we have really, there's no message being conveyed, right? It's just talking, talking at each other. Um, but again, it's a heart issue. If we truly love the person, uh, and I'm not going to say that you don't love the person, but I'm just going to say it's a it's an issue of the heart that you got to deal with to where you got to bring yourself down a little bit so you can um, appreciate the need of this other person. What am I talking about? The heart of a servant. What does it mean to serve? Work. What does it also mean? Inconvenience. Yes, brothers, it's inconvenient to sit there and listen to the whole story. But you got to listen to it. You would rather her tell you the story than someone else. I will move on from there. Uh, we talked about consistency. You know, being operating uh, in the spirit of a servant, you got to be consistent. I'm not going to let life get in the way because, again, like I said earlier, things in life are going to happen. You know, uh, the car going to break down. You know, uh, my count is negative. You know, I got somebody in the hospital. I twisted my ankle. Things happen, but I'm not going to let that keep me from serving God because if I, if I expect to wait till my life gets to where it's eventless, where nothing's going on, I'm going to be waiting and waiting and waiting, right? And so go ahead and serve them now. So I'm trying to wait to where um, the conditions are the way you feel like they need to be. Man, go on and serve God. Some people are like, well, I'm going to wait till I get out of school. Man, go on and serve God. There are people that said that they still in school. Serve them now, right? Don't be waiting on this time in my life where, well, at this point in my life, I'll have some time. Then I'll be able to get active in church. The devil is alive. First of all, tomorrow's not even promised. Serve God now. And then anyway, what kind of excuse is that to give God? Let's just say you do go tomorrow. You tr you're going to tell God, well, God, I was waiting until, um, you know, my schedule was, because, you know, on Tuesdays, you know, I, it's my only day. And have a heart of a servant, man. Go on and serve him now. Don't let stuff get in the way of you serving God. Because guess what? God was consistent with you. And you know, despite the foolishness you did, God was still consistent. He kept you. He protected you. There's some of us, man, we got testimonies. God has kept us. Um in our righteousness, put that in quotations, and in our foolishness, God was consistent. He protected us. He kept us. He sustained us. But yet, we let every little thing get in the way of us doing what we need to do for God. And so, don't let life circumstances change your consistency. But you stay just as consistent in service. Um, you know, we talk about giving. Stay consistent with your giving. Yes, the bills will come. They ain't going to stop coming, right? This is the way life is. But you keep giving. You keep serving God. You keep doing what, what you're required to do, right? Watch God watch God bless. Um, and we talked about service. We talked about when we come in service and we come to praise and worship, we didn't, just because we came and sat doesn't mean we serve God. We just came, stood up, clapped our hands, and sat back down. That's not service. And so, um, again, you got to have a heart of a servant. And we're, we're getting ready to close here. Um, but you want to have the heart of a servant. Listen, don't let the flesh get in the way. Don't let any um, thing keep you from serving God. Again, it's a heart issue. It's an issue of the heart. And you really want to demonstrate. Uh, service is a demonstration of your love for God. Amen. And so, it's again... 
that is our that is the least we can do for God. Amen. The least we can do is love our brother and our sister like we do ourselves. So as we close, um, just want to uh, tell everybody greetings again on behalf of our pastor and founder, Bishop A. Harris. Um, if you would be so kind or if you'd be so led, please donate, give to our ministry through Cash App, dollar sign, all word church. Um, you know, help us, um, you know, as we continue to live stream, we say praise the Lord to all the saints that are tuning in. Say praise the Lord to those um, that are visitors that are tuning in. We hope this message was a blessing to you and hope to see you next week. I will close in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. Oh, God, we give you all glory and honor. Lord, we thank you for the blessing tonight. We pray, oh, God, that something was said, Lord God, that will um, motivate, oh, God, us to start to serve and to serve with the right heart and the right spirit. Lord God, we pray, oh, God, that, that someone was touched tonight and motivated, oh, God, to make the change. God, we thank you. We give you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.